finally gave the Ringers Philly Crew a podcast. I'm Ben Solak. And I'm Shiel Kapadia. That's right. Just a couple of Philly guys with a new space to fire off some Eagles takes, get caught up in the Sixers chaos and more. We'll be coming to you twice a week on Sundays and Thursdays, plus bonus episodes whenever we get breaking news or Philly drama. Join the fun and follow the Ringers Philly special now on Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? Even though creators make the internet valuable, how much value do they get for their work? Well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also, more say, more control, more ownership. Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. Thank you for listening to the Ringers NBA Draft Show. My name is Kevin O'Connor, and every week I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Jay Kyle. Man, Kyle, what's going on, dude? Not too much, Kevo. I just rolled in from the road. It's turned frigid here in Kentucky. I was telling our producer, Jesse, it's kind of like winter was asleep and kind of woke up and was like, oh, shit, I got to make you miserable. So that's what it's been like out here. Uh, so, uh, But, you know, staying warm, watching some fun basketball, ready to talk some draft. Last week, we talked about Wemby, Scoot, the Thompson twins, our guys in the college class during our debut episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. You said you were on the road driving two hours-ish from Kentucky to Indiana and then back. That's because you last night, you were at the Champions Classic. Let's see, number four, Kentucky against Michigan State, and number six, Kansas against number seven, Duke. We saw Kansas beat Duke 69-64 after Kentucky I'm sorry, Kyle. They blew a late lead to Michigan State, <laughs> lost by nine and double overtime. <laughs> How sad was the drive home for you <laughs> after that? Well, I drove home this morning. I was, uh, yeah, were you just a ima- We should maybe do a live stream of, of me just, yeah, just like sitting here. And, you know, I'm press row. I, I feel like it's pretty known that I'm, I'm, I'm a Kentucky person. Uh, there, are, there are fans on press row these days. It's normal. So whenever something bad happens, you just kind of like close you're, you're, the little subtle, you know, the little subtle facial cues. I'd close my eyes, you know, grip my teeth, things like that. <laughs> it was <laughs> Kentucky, yeah, we can talk more about Kentucky, but I, I love the Champions Classic because um, it's it's a fun event um, because and it's kind of changed over the years. Last night, I felt like the crowd wasn't quite as juiced as it normally is, and I That's think you were in press row, Kyle. Well, not I, in the stands with all the fans. In Gamebridge, you can really feel the the energy. It's a pretty intimate place to see. It's kind of like a small, th- and you know, when you see a show in a small theater, it just has a different feel. You know, that's kind of the way it is to see a good basketball game there. That the, the energy like circulates quickly. But I think that like the star power was a little bit down from recent years. Like there are like prospects, like good prospects in the game. But if you think back over the years, I think the one and done era overlapping with the the Champions Classic. I guess the first year it was twenty. 11 12 
which was the Anthony Davis year. Um, and they're just, there wasn't that level of star power. There wasn't like a Zion. You remember we had like the, the Jabari Wiggins. There wasn't, I don't feel like it, I don't feel like it jazzed the NBA community as much. Did you sense that like on, on social media and everything? No, not at all. I mean, granted, Lakers fans all day were losing it because they saw that Rob Palenka was boarding a plane to Indianapolis. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> were they hoping the he day, didn't come back? Lakers fans were go- going crazy. He was caught at the airport. Um, but yeah, him and Bob Myers, and I'm sure there are tons of NBA executives in the crowd. Those are just a couple of you know the guys they kind of showed in passing on TV. Were there any other executives that you saw? saw there you know big name nba gms i didn't really get yeah, it you know i saw a lot of like agents and kind of that that level of person maybe i just coinc- i just didn't happen to see them i was walking around i mean i saw a lot of there were a lot of nba players there i saw i'm pretty sure i saw gary harris uh jason tatum was there um it, it had a pretty nice presence on that front but yeah overall and and maybe it's a function of like watching nba more when you kind of flip hard back to watching college or even the high level games with a lot of young players seemed pretty sloppy um oh it was yeah overall it, the event was it was fun and i was telling our, our producer jesse that anytime i'm in indianapolis or or chicago or new york it's always during college basketball season so i feel like i'm like walking around in a blade runner uh sequel i, ne- I never get to enjoy these cities when it's nice and warm but it was kind of that deal it just was like snowing and i don't know the energy was just different this year so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the prospects that we did see last night in those games duke michigan state kentucky kansas really not much on the michigan state side but what we're going to do is we're going to rank the top five potential first round prospects that nba fans need to know from both of those games i'll start this off kyle first on my board case and wallace on your kentucky wildcats six three six six wingspan freshman guard you know, he choked on two free throws, one at the end of regulation, one at the end of the first overtime. But, yo, eight steals, one huge block. This dude, like, he's a menace on defense, man. Like, I loved watching him. What were your thoughts on his performance? I mean, you nailed it. it, it he physically, defensively, I think, is something that you don't typically see for for a freshman. And, and, and that's kind of been the book on him for a while is that he's just a maniac guarding the ball. His, like his anticipation instincts are just really strong. Uh, and when he, he's the type of player that like, you see this with some of the, like the more, I mean, Jalen Brown was kind of like this. I, I don't think Kaysen's quite as explosive as Jalen, but um, those guys that like went with that anticipation, when they get into a scrum for the ball, they're so physically strong. Like their core strength is really strong. And you kind of notice this when you play against like football players. Like if you play basketball, there's a difference when that type of body hits you and goes for the ball. <laughs> you just kind of, or you know, like when Zion jumps for a rebound, how people just like part like the Red Sea. He has that kind of intrinsic physical strength. Um, he did miss those free throws. They weren't bad misses. No. Um, but defensively, I mean, he was just crazy disruptive all night, uh, jumping in passing lanes, poking balls away. He had one lob disruption that I thought was like maybe the most impressive play of the night where he kind of played center field on a, on a lob pass and, and disrupted it. But uh, yeah, man, he was he was an incredible. Uh, he was probably the most impressive freshman of the night, I would say. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, like he's he's definitely a guarantee lottery guy. I mean, back end of the lottery, maybe if his offense develops over the course of the season, he's five of 10 last night. Um, you know, it's not like he had a spectacular game on the offensive end with 14 points, but he plays his role. Like he can shoot spot up threes. He seems like an intelligent player moving without the ball cutting. He reminds me a bit of a Derek white because of that defensive ability, how, how, how impactful he can be on that end. Um, in a versatile way. Like you said, he's, you know, in the passing lanes. He's got quick hands on ball. He, you know, disrupted that lob. He's versatile. But uh, offensively, I'm not sure, where, like, what level the upside is right now at this point, Kyle. Like, I think by the end of the season for Wallace with Kentucky, for him to go from a mid to late lottery guy to, you know, maybe top five, top seven, what type of development do we need to see from him on the offensive end for the Wildcats this year? Well, there's some overlap between, I think, the development that we want to see from him as a prospect and what I think is going to dictate Kentucky's ceiling as as a team, because I think he needs to be their primary ball handler for them to reach their ceiling, A, because I think he can uh, get to the rim. I, I don't think that's 
the thing with him is the playmaking upside. I, I know that he, and, and you see this a lot with like guys that are being converted from kind of, they're kind of on that, that they're straddling being a wing or being a pure like on ball guy is that you'll see them, their, their playmaking field of view will start from kind of, I'm using my hands to kind of show like a, a narrow kind of a hallway where they'll see downhill things like you draw to you and, and you see a guy over the top like a roller or you get to the rim and you dump it off. But it seems like those plays kind of come first. This isn't something that I've like academically tested or like vetted, but it's my own personal theory. And then as a player gets more comfortable with those things, you'll kind of see their like their like stereo view kind of widen to, to to the point where they see the width. Like the Madden QB vision cone, right? Or like the awareness rating. <laughs> but I don't play Madden, but I, I think that, you, you know, the width of what yeah. you're aware of is dictated by your comfort scoring and getting to the rim. Once you get those kind of pace attributes and you build those things up, you start to see, and you see this with the best playmakers in the league, not trying to launch into that discussion, but I think that he's kind of early in that. I think that it, his pace and dictation and things like that could could be a nice thing. If you have a guy that can really be super switchable at the next level and add you a little dash of playmaking and be passable, like Derek White, like you said. I was talking to somebody on the Kentucky staff, and they mentioned Drew. Drew Holiday. Oh, that's well, a, yeah. That's, that's high a, praise. But, that's a high know. praise, but we're talking phylums, you know, like we talked about. Not before. unreasonable as kind of a construct for what you want him to turn into, where Drew Holiday, part of his great success next to Giannis, you know, even in New Orleans, how good he was there is he can play with and without the ball. He can play with other ball handlers. And I think with Wallace, that's the type of, you know, that's the way he's going to grow. He's not going to be, you don't want him to be a ball dominant, you know, 35% plus usage for your team. That's not who he is. He's going to be a guy that defends multiple positions. You know, last night he did it at a high level playing 44 or 50 minutes, um, you know, and offensively, like he'll give you what the team, what the game needs and what it demands. Um, next up, Grady Dick on Kansas. I loved him last night, Kyle. It was a hell of a lot of fun watching Grady Dick, six foot eight freshman. Uh, <laughs> what a name, first of all. Just need to get that out of the way. Let's, what a name. I mean, <laughs> he, he seems to have a really good sense of humor, too. I, I think <laughs> Grady Dick is a fun personality. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I was just writing like natural, just like in earnest, just innocently writing notes and like writing, you know, Dick did this, Dick did that, that and smooth I giggled, jump shot. Giggled. He Great exploded. Great penetration to the rim. Yeah. Uses his size well, all that stuff. You just giggle, <laughs> giggle, ha ha ha. It's unavoidable. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's get it out of the way. You know, it's like he is one of those names like me. I've grown up. People be like, "Hey, man," they'll throw those things at me, and I'm like, you know, I'm, "I've heard all those jokes." But I, I <laughs> he kind of looks like Andy Warhol <laughs> running around out there. Um, what what impressed you about Grady Dick? Well, I, mean, well, I, I saw here. comments saying he looked like Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, oh my Jeffrey God. Dahmer. Who is the actor in the in the show with Jeffrey Dahmer? Handsome fella. What, what's uh, Evan is Peters? It? Evan Peters. Yeah, Quicksilver yeah. was really good. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's Mary's kind of a Town. compliment. Yeah, handsome guy. <laughs> it's just uh, we'll, uh, leave as, the, we'll leave the actual Jeffrey Dahmer part of this yeah, aside. Not, not that part. They they mean the actor Evan Peters. But anyway, Grady Dick puts his opponents in formaldehyde. My man, he just <laughs> murders them. <laughs> well, hey, last night was an interesting game for Grady Dick, and I'm gonna I want to remember this game for a lot of reasons. For two reasons, one, he showed elite mental toughness. Right, like we saw the bad side of that, and that second half they attacked him. Proctor straight out the gate, possession after possession, they just went at Dick. And then when they switched Dick off of Proctor and put him on a Mitchell, they just started attacking with Mitchell. And then Kansas had to pull him off the floor. But I felt like even when he was getting attacked, his intensity didn't waver. He didn't back down. And then after getting benched, Kansas adjusts the game plan. He comes back late in the game, and this dude comes out guns blazing amazing finish for him seven points in about a minute transition three-pointer on the right wing a lob dunk inside and then an acrobatic layup going down the lane after a cut and he's one of the big reasons why they ended up winning that game uh, i i came away from a feeling this kid has lotto upside you know you look at different boards around the internet right now some people already have him late lotto some places have him late first early second i mean this guy has got a flawless looking jump shot, and he constantly moves without the ball in his hands. He makes the right pass. Defensively, that's going to be the question. That's the other part, though, right? Like defensively, he got attacked. That's where you need to see improvement. But I see lottery upside. 
Uh, what did you think about after last night, Kyle? I agree. I, I I think that I don't know. Did you watch much college basketball in the early 2000s? Because he kind of reminds me. I hate to do the white to white guy thing here, but it's okay. Sometimes it's appropriate. He gives me some Mike Dunleavy Jr. at Duke vibes, like the way I don't know. He was, he gives you a little bit of the passing. He he has a pretty just soft touch. He scored in a variety of ways. The dribble pull up stuff. He got to the rim. I think the thing about like skill guys like this, and you were talking about him looking <laughs> looking like Andy Warhol and Jeffrey Dahmer, blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> but I think when you when you're that kind of a player, he's probably used to being having people come at him like the Chet oh, yeah. thing. If you're the skinny the skinny guy, and it's like I'm sure that he has developed that toughness. But this is a guy that played uh, he played at a, at a school that's basically a prospect factory, Sunrise Christian, which is you know had Michael Foster and Chaden Sharp was there, but. Did play but i'd assume that that kind of cultivated some of that toughness in him but i think i think he's he stands to be a, a one and done for them i think for kansas at a school that really hasn't been playing that game lately you know I, I think he's a he's an interesting player next up we have three duke prospects to sum up our top five prospects from last night Derek lively recovering from a calf injury right now coming off the bench four points in 21 minutes not much of an impressive offensive showing for him i felt didn't get a lot of looks um, defensively, though, you know, he, he showed his rim deterrence. I wasn't overly impressed, Kyle, by Lively uh, against Kansas last night. He looked a little more self-conscious and tentative than I've seen him in other settings. I know some people, I've heard varying things all the way across the spectrum about him throughout his time as a prospect that, like, people were, because he moved to the top. Uh, and Lively was somebody that was ranked. Some people had him as number one in the class, and then I'd hear people talk about it and be like, what? It was sort of a Wiseman-y kind of a thing where people would be like, not seeing it, like hard line, yeah. not seeing it. Huge, um, raw prospects, you know, 7-2. Yeah. He's got the body, right? But the game like hasn't developed. Like that, that's what you mean by the Wiseman thing, right? Where people are split. Yeah, and and I always say these discussions sort of trace the fault lines of like your own personal philosophy. You know how you feel about a player, how willing you are to be patient. Um, another, I think another reason too is that like some of the another guy that we're going to talk about for Duke in a, in a second here. I think some of their other players kind of sucked up a lot of the oxygen uh, offensively and sort of you know whether and they're feeling the, these things out. They're a young team, but he kind of got lost in the mix and in the tentativeness. Um, but I expect to see more from him. I think the conversation from him is like way, way, way far from over in terms of how it's going to evolve. For sure. And I think also like one thing to, that's important to remember with him and one of the reasons why he ranks three on this list, despite, you know, not a huge night. It's because the fact like the NBA setting is going to be better for his skill set at seven two with his, you know, length on offense. It, like you're you're not going to see Duke run a ton of high pick and roll with a five four out spacing and him rumbling down the lane for lob dunks or, you know, short roll opportunities. That's just, just not what you're going to see at the college level quite as much. But that is what you will see him doing in the NBA is screen and rolling. Yeah, there's some skill sets that don't get fed necessarily at the college level because they need to be fed by a certain type of player. Like a certain type of player can can draw the help and make the certain type of pass. You know, news news flash for any anybody that doesn't know it, but you know there are better players in the NBA, so that happens. <laughs> and sometimes those guys can get misevaluated for that reason. I think that's a blind spot. Not all teams, but some fall prey to it. But um, yeah, we, this this is a wait and see thing for him. I think we're going to see a lot more from Derek Lively. Next up is Tyrese Proctor out of Duke, six five Australian guard. I'd like to see the ball in his hands more often as well. I think that could help, also help Lively if, if he's the primary ball handler for them instead of Jeremy Roach moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Proctor, I think, is going to fall into the camp of he's still very young. Um, he's from Australia, in the NBA Global Academy. Um, good size at six foot, si uh, six foot five. Um, he's going to be a candidate to be one of the, you know, there was this word that surfaced last year that would cause some debate, but it's been around for a while called like pre-drafting, which is taking somebody ahead of the evaluation cycle which, to sort of maybe gain an edge if you feel like they're going to be a certain type of player. Um, one of these, which is uh, sort of like a yucky sort of timing, but uh, Josh Primo was one of those types of players uh, that you take early. Uh, and and assume that they're going to develop on your time. And I think Proctor is that type of guy. Like I I think he he shows little glimmers of feel. Um, sometimes you see guys out there that are 18 years old, like Wendell Moore, like in his first Champions Classic. You and I were there for that. He was just utterly lost in the first game. Um, so if you're willing to like assume and, and and bet on him coming back, I just think he has great dribble separation. He has great playmaking kind of upside. I think he's a very interesting player. 
it's been cool to see all, all these Australian prospects coming in with that playmaking sense. Dyson Daniels, oh, Josh Dyson. Giddy. You know, granted, Ball's not Australian, but play down there, you know, for a year. Ben Simmons, despite how things are going for him right now. Just a, lo- a lot of good passers have come through Australia in recent years. And, and is Proctor on the level of some of those guys with passing vision, creativity? Uh, like, where does he, how does he compare to, like, say, Giddy, who's like an outlier level, or Dyson Daniels, who's a tick below that? I would say, he, yeah, he's definitely a full level below Giddy, but Giddy is pretty exceptional. You're talking yeah. about like width of the floor, your kind of stereoscopic view of the width of the court. He's definitely below the, obviously below ball, every human on the planet is. Um, Dyson's an interesting one, though. It's kind of the question of, is Proctor going to be, he's not as big as Dyson, but is Proctor going to be an on-ball kind of guy like that or a connective kind of playmaker? Um, I don't know how much you've seen of him, but I, I think... I'd probably lean more as a, as a connector, but uh, we'll see. Kyle Filipowski last night for Duke, you know, 17 points on 18 shots. Not great efficiency, but I, I don't think it matters. You know, coming away from watching that game, that dude was everywhere, crashing the boards, 14 rebounds, high effort, intensity, yelling, screaming, and showed his versatility too. Like he's he can handle the ball for a big man, right? We saw him run a DHO at one point, attack off the dribble there to get to the basket. He can hit threes for you. He can hit jumpers, you know, and from mid-range, he just plays his ass off, man. I think Filipowski, he might not be, you know, I don't see lottery upside for him, um, but like as a late first guy, an early second rounder maybe, uh, I feel very comfortable with him in that range for, you know, you're thinking about NBA teams that typically draft in that range, someone who might need a six foot eleven center to come in right away and maybe fill some minutes while growing it within their role, I think he he stands out as a prospect that kind of fits that mold. Yeah, talking about like sucking up the oxygen, like we were talking before. I'm basically talking about Filipowski. I mean, he based and Duke is is in an interesting situation where they, I weirdly expect Shire to be a little bit more of a roster builder than Coach K was. Like I I just that's my own prediction. K kind of got away from that as the one and done era came in. And he just started like bringing dudes in, but Filipowski. All in on one of the. <laughs> he was just like, just bring it in. We'll make sense of it later. It's kind of the cow. The cow. Cal Perry does the same kind of thing, uh, and you end up with weird rosters as a result of that. But Filipowski, uh, there was a there was one point where there was a pick and roll that Kansas was running, and Filipowski was guarding the ball, and uh, Lively was in drop. I was like, there's just not a lot of college teams that can run that out there. But I think you you hit it. I mean, he's kind of got that like almost two motion jump shot that's flicky hasn't been really consistent he was bad in their first two games like uh, maybe not outright bad but just chaotic i'd heard that in practice that he hadn't really looked great that there'd been concern about him like maybe not being what they thought but he was sort of a late riser in his class he went from like the 15 to 20 range to like top five ish so um he's kind of coming around and we're figuring out exactly what he is but um if the shooting gets really consistent and he can, he's not like a great athlete. Did you see the play where he drove? He like attacked a closeout and like took contact and finished through like he decelerated. I thought that was a pretty impressive play. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's got footwork. He's got a bit of a handle. He's a solid player. I think, like you said, Kyle, he wasn't great in their first two games. You want to see him, you know, develop some efficiency. Even last night, like, like we said, he, he puts up some numbers and volume, 17 points, but it's on 18 field goal attempts. Um, part of that is because offensive rebounds, the way those are tracked and all that. Um, but overall, I was impressed by him. And, and I think, you know, on the other side of Duke, you know, Mark Mitchell, solid player. He's got a shot, um, you know, but the best prospect on Duke didn't even play, Derek Whitehead. Um, why is he out right now? When can we expect to see him? And um, for listeners of the show, what can they expect to see once Whitehead is back on the floor? Because he could be the best of all of them. Okay, yeah, uh, Derek Whitehead, like you said, he was kind of the thing that people were really wanting to see. I think that that would have been. It's amazing that they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna add this guy. Is I think Duke, all, as it is, could turn into a pretty good team. But the pitch for for Derek is he's six foot six, about one hundred ninety pounds, be about nineteen years old when he on draft night. This he's been playing in like advanced schemes for a while, like playing on like so, sort of a pseudo college program at Montverde. Um, and he's been he's been with them since 2018. So he's played with a lot of talent. Scotty Barnes, Cade Cunningham. Uh, I think he was even a freshman with R.J. Barrett. So he's been around good players. And 
He's tough, explosive. I think an interesting kind of dialogue will be what he brings versus what Kaysen brings when it comes to draft night because he's a better athlete with longer arms than Kaysen. I think his offensive upside is stronger. Um, the question is, you know, the injured foot. Like, what what are we going to get to see him much this season? Feet are really tricky. I think the foot was the thing that kept Kyrie out for most of the season, right, when he when he was a freshman? Yeah, and there doesn't seem to be a, a specific timeline for his return either after the surgery. That injury was in late August, and, you know, we're mid-November right now. Um, you know, hopefully he can come back because I, I think he's got a chance to, you know, smash into that top five, top six, top six, top seven or so, kind of be in that conversation. We talked about Cam Whitmore last week where you're going to see debates come April, May, June about, well, who do you prefer of these of these guys? I think Whitehead could be in that conversation. How important is it for him to play this season for Duke to, to elevate his draft stock? Or is he the type of player that maybe it'd be more beneficial to just you know, stay away, play a real conservative, <laughs> stay, stay away. These days it's different, right? You know, I, I, I think that like, can you think of a guy that had questions that like really needed to be answered coming into college? And we were like, we got to see him or else we won't go with him. Like, cause it seems like there's so much documentation of these guys before they get to college these days that it seems like it seems less pertinent than ever. Right. If he didn't you have experience to play college. It with Shaden Sharp yeah, last year. I right. I mean, like he, he, doesn't play <laughs> all season long at Kentucky. And, you know, people are going off what they have from high school. He still goes seventh, and he's having an awesome start to the season for the Blazers. Yeah, it seems like it, it kind of begs the question. It's just like, well, it, it's a question that's been around. It's like, do these guys need to play college at all? Is it worth their time? Is it a maturity thing? Is it better for them to just get on like the way the Euro teams do, just get on with a pro program and, and start developing with them on their time? Or do they need to go develop and mature? I, there are a lot of different facets to that. Dariq, I think, falls in that camp of like, I think people who follow this probably have a pretty good idea of who he is. He's not somebody that's kind of like a proctor type that has some questions that need to be answered. He'll probably still get picked pretty high, even if he doesn't play a Duke at all, I would imagine. Wouldn't yeah, you think? I, I yeah. would think so. So just to recap so far who we've talked about, Cason Wallace on Kentucky, Grady Dick, on Kansas and three Duke prospects, Derek Lively, Tyrese Proctor, Kyle Filipowski, and then Dariq White, who we didn't see last night. So here are some other quick hit names from the two games we watched last night. On the Kansas side of things, Kevin McCuller, 6'6 swing. I was impressed by him last night. He's got a little bit of a handle, some passing sense. The question with him is going to be his jumper. Never shot it at a good level prior to the season two or four last night. Seems like he'll be a low volume guy, you know, at best if he ever develops as a shooter. But, you know, the reason why he could even be a prospect is because of his defense. Lockdown on ball defender, switchable, versatile, wear off ball. And he had this uh, a transition defensive play last night where it was Filipowski in transition. McCullough was, you know, laying back kind of like a safety backpedaling and then just perfectly timed his swipe at the ball, then saved it from going out of bounds, found a teammate, and that led to a transition basket going the other way for Jalen Wilson, who's another impressive prospect on the Kansas side of things. 6'8", junior. You know, he's had a tough road up to this point. Broke his ankle early his freshman season. Struggled his redshirt year. Then got a DUI before his sophomore season. And now his junior year, you know, through, through three games, 19, 11, and 7 on 3 of 7 from 3 in Game 1. Game 2, 21, 9, and 1 on 3 of 6 from 3. Last night, 25 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists. 0 of 7 from 3, and shooting has been the concern for him. That's the make-or-break skill for Jalen Wilson. But now on the season, averaging 22 points, 10 rebounds, 4 assists, 30% from 3. You know, between McCullough and Wilson, Kyle, they seem more like second-round prospects. Um, did, any thoughts on uh, what they you saw from them last night? I think Kansas has a nice luxury that they have some pretty great size and some of their initiators that you don't get to see a lot from college teams. I thought Wilson looked, you know, even the shooting, I think, will even out and stabilize some. I don't know that he'll stay as low as 30, but he looked poised. And I, I thought he looked like one of the more the steadier players out there, even though the shot wasn't always going down, but you nailed it on the, on the like transition zoning thing. And like, I, I think that that's something people overlook when they think about the NBA playing 
mostly man concepts, you can't escape zone concepts, even in man schemes. So like being able to zone intelligently is something that there are even good NBA players that there, there are NBA players who are productive, who still struggle with that. Uh, so that, that is a skill set that is really valuable because if you're off the ball and you stink at zoning or you don't have good instincts or anticipation, teams can pick on you. So I think that you, you nailed it picking out that detail. There were a couple of transition blocks last night though, that were incredible. I think t- Kansas had one and one sequence. Um, I'm trying, I'm blanking on who on who made the plays, but uh, it was it was a fun kind of up and down uh, thing there. On the Michigan State Kentucky side, Michigan State has that great double overtime win. Are there really any prospects on on that side, Kyle? Yeah, uh, that, that stand out as NBA guys. There are guys that I think could play their way into like into the second round range. Um, I, I don't. No one. We're a tier below. I feel like. I mean, you've Sisko, heard a lot about. Maybe. You've heard about Sissoko a lot lately. That was somebody that people tabbed in high school. Hauser's um, off, brother made it, you know. Yeah, Hauser could get in as a, as a catch and shoot guy. I don't know how many people thought Sam Hauser was going to be mm. was going to be what he is. Um, shooting is, you know, shooting is a premium. You would think Kentucky would have figured out maybe guard guard Hauser after a little <laughs> while. Uh, maybe stay attached. <laughs> oh, on what's the, going on there, Kyle? I, I don't understand. There was defense like four stuff. times I don't in a row. Much of anything. It was like four times in a row. I was I was just like snapping a pencil in half as I watched that happen. Um, anyway, man. Um, but so Kentucky loses that game. But where uh, last night, you know, Oscar Shibwe, you know, had a good performance: twenty two points, eighteen rebounds, four blocks. Um, you know, what did you think about his performance and his NBA upside? Was really feeling himself last night, man. I've never he was it, every play he was doing the Drew. The Drew Timmy must have rubbed off on him during all those Player of the Year ceremonies where they got to know each other because he was just every time down doing some kind of antic. I want to talk to you more about this on another episode, just about like there's a glut of quality dominant big guys in college basketball that are staying around maybe because of NIL that aren't translating to the NBA. And I want to talk more about like why we don't have time today. Oscar, though, I mean. It's a question because you wonder about his size and space. He's not the biggest guy in the world, but positionally, he's really dominant. He kind of has that Steven Adams quality where he just beats people up with his elbows and his butt, and people just get tired of blocking him out, <laughs> and he wears you down. He does. Yeah. Uh, he had some pretty critical turnovers and fouls at bad times, but he also uh, didn't look like he missed a beat after his knee surgery. He just came out and was dominant. I expect him to be more of a second-round prove-yourself type guy. I don't know that a team's going to invest a lot in him. Um, what, what do you think? He's solid. You know, I mean, I think with him, you bring him in to an NBA roster. It's about who's our guy that's going to battle a Jokic or Embiid, you know, with brute size coming off your bench. So I think there's value in having those guys, right? Um, so there is a pathway to him to having success in the NBA, but overall, I'm not like, you know, flipping out over drafting him to my team. Yeah, big guys that you can park near the basket, he has really struggled with. Like, because yeah. he just doesn't have, he doesn't get off the ground quickly. He doesn't have crazy length. But that's um, what you hope for, right? Like, that's what you want him for to grow into. You hope he becomes like a finesse guy that can kind of nickel and dime you with his bag around the rim. But it's like, is he like, he's like an Isaiah Stewart type body, but I don't think that he's as yeah. like mobile as Isaiah. And I don't think that he has the shooting upside. I mean, maybe, possibly, but uh, his anticipation was pretty good last night. Defensively, I thought, held his own. But I think you put him in like ball screens. I just don't think that he can access the the vertical space that he's going to have to. He's going to have to become like incredibly incredible positionally I think to play defense in that sense at the NBA level. He's 6 foot 9, you know, got length, heavy, but you're right Kyle. You know, mobility wise needs to improve a lot there. Anybody else on the Kentucky side of things? You know, Chris Livingston projected first round pick. He did nothing. He stunk last night. Oof. Um, you know, Collins stopping. Any other quick hit thoughts on the Kentucky guys? Those are the other interesting guys. Uh, Jacob Toppin it projects as like a really slinky, long, switchable athlete. Obi's younger brother, if people don't know, he needs to shoot the ball. We'll, we can talk more about him. Damian Collins is uh, one of one of the words I've coined lately is a, a, a weirdo, a lovable weirdo athletically, kind of a Chris Boucher type body. Um, can, has, he has a lot of interesting upside. We, he, it's a long way away, though. Chris Livingston was awful. Other than that, uh, uh, no, nobody, nobody of note. All right, for our weekly Wemby update to close the show here, Kyle, you know, he played for the French national team twice this past week at 29 points, nine rebounds, one assist in his first game in a dub for France, 19 points, four rebounds, one assist in his second game, another dub for France. I thought he was 
continue to be amazing in both of those games. Um, he had one little scary fall where his leg split. You texted me the clip of that at one point. Um, but rim protection was still there. He hit another floater three that made the internet go crazy. Uh, I'm continually amazed by this guy, regardless of the level of competition. Yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a quick correlation between the Holger stuff and, and the floater threes. I don't know that I'm going to draw a connection that's not there, like a bad detective. But Could that I, become a signature shot for him? I think so, but the point that I was kind of making was it scares me because um, him floating forward and landing on people is terrifying. I mean, like, I, I just... He was trying to... Somebody made the correct point on Twitter that he may have been trying to draw a foul there in the situation, but he's done it twice, um, and he has touch, man. I mean... It, it looks intentional, man. I mean, he might have been trying to draw a foul there, but, like, it looks normal for him. It, like, it yeah. looks like a normal, like, Jalen Brunson taking a, a footer inside the paint. That's what it looks like when Wembenyama takes a float from behind the three point line. <laughs> we just need to we need to minimize Wimby fall down. You know, like uh, I know they always talked about uh, Chris Farley sketches. They would be like, uh, "Oh, is this fatty fall down?" They didn't want that. Uh, any, that was a horrible comparison. But we need to we need to minimize Wimby fall down uh, in games just because it scares me. Yeah, he slipped in that game that I sent you, and it, it just looked catastrophic. Like um, I don't know. I, I like the idea of that shot. If he can avoid landing on people, I, you know, great. But th- the fact that he has the touch to do that, I, what are you going to do with that? You're going to foul him if you try to block it. It's it's such a weird shot. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful shot, too. Scary, but absolutely beautiful. Uh, we also have a Scoot Henderson update. We touched on his slow start for the G League Ignite last week. He's been good since in his two game against Santa Cruz. You know, he led a comeback with 16 assists to five turnovers. 8 of 19 from the floor, not super efficiency, um, 2 of 4 from 3. And then against the OKC Blue uh, on Monday, he had his best game of the season overall as a score, 10 of 16 from the floor, 26 points, getting wherever he wanted on the floor. Um, You know, the question with him has been the efficiency of his jump shot. He's shooting 45% from 3 now in the season, shooting above 40% on mid-range pull-ups as well, according to Synergy. I've been highly impressed by Scoot. I, 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 it's, again, a very small, tiny sample size, but early October, the games we went to against the Mets 92, his jumper looked better than it did last year. So far this season for the Ignite, it continues to look better. That's that's going to be the skill for him. If that jumper continues to be efficient, like I think he locks himself into that number two spot and nobody else is going to be able to come close. Yeah, the shooting has been surprising. It, like forty five is a number. I w- we'll see if it sticks, but that that was would yeah. not have been a number I would have expected. I, I was kind of paying attention to his passing. I kind of, I'm in kind of a stasis with the scoring stuff. I'm more. I know he can get to the rim. Like I know that. I know he can get to that dribble pull up jumper. The more the que- the kind of like teeter area where I'm paying close attention to is sort of the development of his sense of when to get rid of it, and then like pass placement I've noticed on a lot of his turnovers he can kind of get in and that's patience you know when you play as fast as he does like slowing down and when you have the ability to play that fast like a lot of his turnovers are sort of like velocity placement kind of things like he'll get in the lane and just kind of whip it way too fast to somebody that's way too close or he'll get you know he'll draw to and like throw it at chest level when he could easily bounce it just his kind of feel for when to use what pass on his tool belt is kind of a thing that I've kind of been watching closely because I feel like the other stuff is kind of solidified. Uh, I mean, he's going to get better, obviously, but for the con- for sake of the conversation around the draft, the scoring stuff, I'm kind of in a comfortable place about how I feel about him. I think the passing is more interesting to me. And by the way, Scoot had another amazing game Wednesday morning for the G League Ignite, scoring 27 points with 14 coming in the fourth quarter as part of this ferocious run to lead the Ignite back uh, with another win over the blue. He's been absolutely amazing. To close out the show, we're going to talk about our scouting schedules over the next week, next Wednesday on our next show, Kyle. We're going to be talking about Imani Bates, you know, the YouTube sensation, viral high school star, went to Memphis and then Eastern Michigan. It's been a tough road for him, but you know, through two games, you know, 30 points on 12 and 19 against Michigan in his debut, a top 25 team, and then 20 points on against Bradley after a horrible first half. The crowd was, you know, chanting overrated, you know, because of his struggles. But he finished with 20 points on 6 of 14. 
We'll get two more games in from Amani Bates before we, you know, go go all in discussing him. It's not like he has two big opponents. He's he's facing Oakland on Saturday and then Purdue, Fort Wayne next Tuesday. <laughs> Purdue, Fort Wayne. But I will, we'll be keeping an eye on those games over the coming week. We'll talk definitely talk about Amani Bates next week because he's suddenly reemerging as a potential prospect. Is there any games you're going to be keeping an eye on uh, over this next week, Kyle? Sunday, I mean, it's not not to be self-serving again, but I think the Gonzaga UK game is going to be pretty interesting to watch. One. Yeah, uh, but the Amani the Amani stuff I think is interesting, um, just because of the, of the story of it. And I think that his case is, if you just look at the type of player he is, and these are all things I want to talk about on the show when we get to it. But um, his his sort of makeup as a player and his expectations and how that affected his development, it's fascinating, man. I, 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 it's, it's he's a case study. I feel like. It's going to be interesting to watch his development over the season, too, because the, they've put the ball in his hands and said, hey, do your thing, just like he did in high school. It's unlike, unlike what the situation he had in Memphis. But I'm, let's get two more games in from Imani Bates, and then we'll have a, a much more to talk about with him. Kyle, this was fun, man. I'm sorry Kentucky lost last night and kind of ruined your night, but two good basketball games, man. It was. It was, you know, whatever. It's fine. I, I rebound quickly from from disappointment as in my <laughs> fandom. I don't know if you do. Maybe it's just you you, you go around, the you do enough laps and, uh, and and whatever. What are you getting into today, Kev? Uh, well, uh, Warzone 2 launches in three minutes, so that's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> How excited are you, man? I, I'm excited, man. I'm fired up about it. I'm, it's, it's playing, living in LA now, away from most of my friends back in Massachusetts. Playing Warzone's a perfect way to to hang out with them virtually, right? Like we just talk, you know, shoot the shit. And we're, just, we're just hanging out. We just happen yeah. to be playing a video game at the same time. It's, it's not. It's like we're back in high school again during winter, right? Where like nobody's seeing each other as often. It's snowing outside, <laughs> and we're just chilling. It's it's a good time being able to hang out with my friends doing that. How about you? We get anything going on today? Uh, you know, just as a parent, I was hoping maybe to get some, some, uh, some hooping in today and then go pick my son up. That's all very exciting stuff that people love to hear about. But I was curious, I mean, what's, what's your, what's your regimen on like, uh, when you're, how seriously do you take it when you're playing? Do you, you get on like a coffee thing? Do you avoid carbs? Like, I don't want to get sleepy, you know? Oh, I don't, I don't drink coffee. Yeah. I'll never, okay. I'll never okay. drink coffee. Okay. Well, at least one of us. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll have kids and that'll change someday. Um, but I, I've yet to find that find a need for coffee. I just drink a lot of water. You said you were good at Warzone. I was just curious if how seriously you took it. You know, when I know I'm going to be hooping, I'm like, I take a couple ibuprofen. I, I always play to calves. win. When yeah. you play pickup basketball, do you play to win, Kyle? Oh, I'm a maniac. I play to win, man, all the time, no matter what it is. I want I want my team to win. I want us to flourish. But also, I think most importantly, though, because it is a video game, you're playing to have fun, right? It is that. Sure. But I always want to win. Long range? So you sort of melee? You get in there, mix it up? Or you like you stand back, pick them off? I'm a versatile, versatile player. You know, I, I okay. think I've become somebody who excels in close range. But the new game is going to be a little different the way close range happens. They, they remove something called slide canceling. Uh, which is like an, inter- an integral mood where you would slide on the ground and pop back up in the prior, you know, Call of Duty. Uh, yeah. But they removed the ability to do that. So it's going to change the game in close range. Were people spamming it? Is that why they had to get rid of it? It was like a take foul type thing? It was just part of the movement. Like it, it was like the way you, it's like in the NBA, you got to shoot threes to adapt, right? Or you're screwed. You got to shoot threes at least, you know, over a quarter of your shots. You're not slide canceling in a close range battle in Call of Duty. You're you're at a disadvantage. Oh that, my that's God. what I would say. The little worlds you uncover just if you yeah. just poke around a little bit. This is unbelievable. <laughs> people, the, the listenership right now is just <laughs> no, nah, dude. People love Warzone. It's uh, I just it's find true. it fascinating. It's one of the most popular games in the world. <laughs> it passed me down. It passed me by. I played the original Call of Duty on like PC, and it's come a long way from there. But anyway, fun stuff. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. I'll talk to you, Kyle, next Wednesday. Thank you to Jesse Lopez for producing. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Peace.